Yo, what's good, E2? Welcome back. It's your boy, Scholar, and today we got the most dangerous race in the world. I hope you guys enjoy. As always, please leave a like, comment, subscribe, and let's get it. This is the most dangerous race on Earth. Motorcycles flying at over 200 miles per hour on the public road. At times, even fully airborne. And since its inception, over 280 so people have died racing here. Many people are calling for it to be oh banned, my God. but the fans, organizers, and of course, the racers themselves refuse to let that happen. So let's take a look at this race going back over a hundred years and find out if it's truly Damn, worth to race years? at the Isle of Man TT, or if to, it's just to think about it, right? Sports. To have a motorcycle a hundred years ago, right? You know what type of technology you had to have? Like the technology they had back then to work with compared to now where you have like AI, like everything is just like a push of a button and things happen. Like back then, like everything is like, what? No calculators. No, it's, it's bro. It's so impressive. Oh my God. Suicide. The Solby Strait, the fastest section of the 37 mile TT course, what? 200 miles per hour. Oftentimes Damn, with only he one out. tire touching the ground thanks to the many bumps and crests in the road's surface. This isn't that a is race sketchy. for ordinary people. Hell, this isn't even a race for ordinary racing drivers. This is a race for people who are undeniably, unequivocally insane. This year, there are a few familiar crazy. Peter Hickman, Connor Cummins, John I just did a reaction to Peter Hickman. Did it? It was on board Peter Hickman. I think it got blocked, actually, right? But I did a reaction, bro. He was, he, he had the fastest lap time. I'm like, what? John McGinnis and, of course, Michael Hillier Crazy. Peter Hickman, Connor Cummins, John McGinnis, and, of course, Michael Dunlop. All are seasoned riders at the Isle of Man, but Michael Dunlop, he comes from a lineage of TT champions. Oh, Robert, really? his father. Joey, his uncle, and William, his brother. The Dunlop Damn. dynasty goes back nearly 50 years. But the Dunlop family represents more than just the glory of the TT. Because Michael is the only surviving member of the Dunlop dynasty. His brother, what? father, and uncle all lost their lives racing motorcycles. And just this year... Bro, R.I.P., man. Like, doing something you love is... You know, it can't be too sad. It can't because they, they go out doing something they love. You feel me? So, but damn, RIP, man. On the Isle of Man, five racers were killed in horrible accidents during the race, which seems insane. Surely this race is too dangerous to continue doing. But for nearly 120 years, the TT has yet to be stopped. And to understand why, we need to go back to the evolution of bike of. The very first race on the Isle of Man was held as a slap in the face to Britain's Motor Car Act of 1903. The Motor Car Act regulated speeds on British highways to 20 miles per hour, and it allowed local towns to implement even lower speeds as requested. By this point in time, Wait. racing was already huge in Europe, and racers in the UK saw this as a major setback. Sir Julian Ord, the secretary of the automobile... Look at the car, though. Back in the day, no windscreen, because they're not going that fast. So just like the strolling, no radio, no nothing. Oh Club of Great Britain you just got to pray that it's not going to rain. <laughs> Ireland thought that this new act would put a strain on the advancement of performance oriented vehicles. And so he took action and set off to the Isle of Man in hopes of mm. persuading the Isle's government to see things his way. Now, the Isle of Man is protected by the British military and is represented by the United Kingdom in foreign matters. But ultimately, nice. the Isle of Man is self-governing and the local parliament is in charge of all domestic affairs. Sir Julian Ord, a charming fellow, wined and dined a few Manx officials. By the way, Manx means from the Isle of Man. And Sir Julian Ord asked them if he could organize a race for the advancement of the British motor car, of course. The Manx authorities were happy to host this race and be part of the progress of the British automobile. So in 1904, the very next year, the Highways Act of 1904 was passed. And it allowed the Ooh. Isle of Man to set up a 52-mile course for the Gordon Bennett 52. Car Trials of 1904. That's right, the first races on the Isle of Man were car races and the trials were a screaming success oh so i didn't even know that so it started off as cars and then it transitioned to motorcycles hmm. the isle of man 
were car races. And the trials were a screaming success. Clifford Earl won the first event doing five laps in seven hours and 26 minutes. And he won seven it again hours? the very next year in 1905, having done six laps in six hours and six minutes. But by this year, people wanted more. More speed, more excitement, more danger. And so it was in this year that motorcycles were first introduced, competing the day after the cars race. It was called the International Motor Car Cup Race. But funny enough, bikes back then weren't quite like bikes now. Most of them didn't have enough power to get up the steeper sections of the oh. course. And so they had to restructure the entire course to account for these low power two wheeled racers. This new abridged route allowed the first winner, J.S. Campbell, to finish the course in See, he does learn and adapt. <laughs> four hours and nine minutes. A blisteringly fast result for the time and his bike only caught fire once. People absolutely loved the no motorcycle. No big deal, race. just so bike caught it so on fire once. January of no. 1907, it was proposed that motorcycles should headline their own event at the aisle. Both the racers and organizers were on board, so they whipped up some new guidelines. It would host two classes, single cylinder machines that averaged 90 miles per gallon and twin cylinder machines that averaged 75 miles per gallon. On top of that, they required regulations for saddles, pedals, mud guards, exhaust silencers, but that was it. So in May of 1907, the inaugural International Auto Cycle Tourist Trophy took place. But if you were in the Not club, nice. you called it the Isle of Man TT. And it was a smashing success. 26 Bro, this has been around for over a century and I'm now learning about this sport. Like I did like two previous reaction to it, but this is like an actual like in depth about it, which I'm glad I found. I wasn't gonna react to this because it sounds familiar, but the of the first video that I react to about it. But yeah, anyways people entered the event with only 13 of them finishing and charlie collier set the fastest lap in his three and a half horsepower matchless motorcycle and year by year as more competitors signed up those lap records were whittled away like by 1910 it. the fastest laps were in the low three hour range and by 1911 the entire course was adjusted again now it was 37 and a half miles and it was called the snaefell mountain course and along with this new course came a new class the Junior TT. This was open to 300cc single cylinder bikes and 340cc twin cylinder bikes. And it was a four lap race instead of the five laps of the senior class. But perhaps the biggest addition for this year were the grandstands along the Ooh. course. Because by now, the crowds of spectators were so massive that just the lawns and sidewalks along the road weren't it was enough. The very first Damn, winner- Damn, so like what, 30 something months? Wow, that's a lot of people. And then good too with the stand, you have like a good view of it. Cause usually when you're just standing, you can't really see. But when you have when you're um elevated a little bit, you have a better like POV of like on what's going on. The new course was Junior TT class Percy Evan racing on a Humber motorcycle. He finished his four laps in three hours and 37 minutes, averaging about 41 miles per hour. In the senior class, Oliver Godfrey set the fastest time of three hours and 56 minutes riding an Indian motorcycle. So as you can see, Sir Julian Ord was onto something when he started this race. And the Isle of Man was quickly becoming world famous with its ridiculous speeds and heroic racers. But along Damn. with those rapidly growing speeds came a rapidly growing death toll. There is a safe way to race though, and it's called a high performance driver education event. That's why we're happy to announce that this episode is supported. If you're already for Wayland Benjamin Race Price, the link in the description. 1911 race was the first time that somebody died racing at the Isle of Man. Victor Surridge was killed in an accident oh, during lack practice. Of he was attempting to overtake another racer, but ran wide and crashed into a ditch. The medics oh. said that at the speed that he was going, he likely died on impact. This death was tragic, but like I said, it was only the first. So at the time, many saw it as a unlucky moment for the sport, a one-off tragedy. But what people didn't know at the time was that just one person dying at the mm -hmm. TT would later be considered one of the safest weekends in its entire history. Over the years, oh, really? the TT proved to be a immensely deadly race. Including that first death in 1911, 265 motorcycle racers have lost their lives on that course. Plus, one person wow. was killed racing a car. Two more racers died during parade laps. Five racing officials have died in accidents. And even two spectators have been killed. And then there were the other fatal incidents. Yeah, the spectators are way too close to the track. Way too close. 
we'll talk about later. Today, in 2022, the death toll is at 280 people. Wow. Now, to be totally fair, not all of these deaths were during the actual Isle of Man TT race. Only 155 people have died during practice or actual oh, race. But the 280 that death is toll so figure unfortunate. The people that died during the Manx Grand Prix and I would be so mad. But the 280 that is so Only 155 people have died during practice or actual races. But the 280 death toll figure includes the people that died during the Manx Grand Prix and Clubman TT races of the 1940s and 50s. The Manx Grand Prix was the amateur racer's version of the Isle of Man TT. And the Clubman TT was a class for production motor cars during the 40s and 50s. These classes were meant for new names to rise up the ranks. And the real stars mm -hmm. of the sport weren't allowed to participate. Needless to say, putting total amateurs up to a grueling race like the TT ended badly for a lot of competitors. Damn. No matter how experienced you were, the TT is a race that is always knocking on death's door. The deadliest year ever, 2005, where 11 people died. The safest years, one well, year? since 1937, the only year where there were zero fatalities, 1982. It's insane to think about. Anyone who attended, whether you were a racer or a spectator, knew that at least one of the people that lined up at the start line going to wouldn't die. be around the end of the day but nah, that's not to say that's insane wow that's crazy to think about just a group of guys lined up about a race and almost guaranteed that one of them is not going to make it that's insane <laughs> wow. say that the event organizers didn't try to make things safer there have been numerous attempts over the years to increase safety and mitigate fatalities but sadly like most things today those safety adjustments only came after tragic incidents frank mm. bateman died in 1913 and so crash helmets became mandatory from 1914 onward in 1927, Archie Birkin died during practice when he collided with a fish fan that was just driving on the open road. So from 1928 onwards, practice sessions were held on closed public roads. In 1934, Sid Crabtree crashed in heavy fog. Organizers didn't know where he was for over half an hour until a random bystander stumbled across his lifeless body. Oh, so from 1935, man. they employed two motorcycle riding traveling marshals that had one job, to search for missing riders. Yet, in that same year, Doug J. Perry died after crashing due to poor visibility because of mist and fog. So in 1936, yeah. they implemented a weather delay policy in which races were postponed. To That's kind of like how Kobe died too in a helicopter because he was flying through like fog and he flew right into a cliff or well, a mountain, whatever. Yeah, the next day, if the weather was inclement, fog and they is even something moved to not practice sessions to the evening to avoid the slippery morning dew. And during the 50s, there were a bunch of new regulations made, even a full course restructuring. Some of the roads were widened, and buildings that were deemed too close to dangerous corners were totally demolished. But the danger was Damn. ever present. In 1970, six people died at the TT. So in 1971, there was further road widening. But it really seemed like no matter how many safety precautions were taken, the speed of the bikes and the racers would far outpace whatever the organizers could do. Fast forward to 2004, and a newcomer named Sergei Lemol crashed and died during his first practice session. So in 2005, what? they implemented a newcomer speed control lab that was introduced to familiarize newbie riders with the course. Yet in that same year, a Swedish rider named Joaquin Carlsson crashed at high speed on the Kirk Michael Bend. This happened to be right outside the home of Marjorie and Ian Forrest, who not only witnessed the crash but were there when the medics came. Carlson Damn. died right there in their front lawn. And the worst part was that the medical helicopter was too busy with other crashes to come pick up Carlson's body. And so he was put into a body bag and left in the Forrest family's front lawn for 90 minutes before practice Damn. finally ended and the body could be picked up. And then there was the 2018 course car incident. A racer named Dan Mean had a horrible crash. So an official course car was sent out to go help at the scene. The course car was full, carrying police officers and it was traveling at a high speed to get to the scene. Before you start the race, you have to sign a waiver, right? There's a lot of paper you have to sign because there's a high chance you're not going to make it. <laughs> this is like, I just keep hearing death and this person, you know, crashing and that person dying. That's, this is so sad, bro. 
Holy the accident as quickly as possible. But at the same time, racers that were on the course were being directed backwards to the nearest grandstand area so they could clear the course for the officials. Steve Mercer was one of those racers. And out of the blue, the TT course car came around a bend at high oh, speed no. and collided with Mercer head on. Steve Mercer thankfully survived, but he was unconscious what? for five days and he In was hospitalized for five months. Through no fault of his own, Steve Mercer was yet another victim of the TT. Immediately after that accident, a new red flag protocol was put in place. Now riders must stop and wait on the course until the accident is clear. And they can only travel in course direction accompanied by marshals front and rear. So there absolutely have been efforts to make the race safer. But sadly, almost all of these safety measures I think every rider, I don't know the technology they have over there, but I think every rider should have like some type of like earpiece. Or some type of like notification song, like a buzz, not even a buzz, because what it's like it vibrates, but like something they can hear when there's a crash. Because you waving a red flag and they're coming at you at like a hundred and something miles an hour, right? Almost 200 miles an hour. They're not going to stop in time. Like, <laughs> yeah. Are reactive instead of proactive, and they're at the cost of the lives of hundreds of TT racers. As Sir Julian Ord predicted a hundred years ago, when given the freedom, the automobile will continue to get faster and faster. And for the TT, that also meant that the race would continue to get more and more dangerous. But despite its dangerous nature and ever increasing death toll, the Isle of Man TT continues to attract record breaking crowds. Through the new millennium, the race has grown tremendously. And in 2019, the largest crowd yet was recorded with over 46,000 spectators. Then the race took a break for two years because of the pandemic. But regardless, it's proof that despite all oh, the negative press, mm. spectators and racers alike love the Isle of Man TT. But of course they do. What is there not to love? Every yeah. year we get to see the fastest and I'm craziest motorcycle <laughs> racers on the planet compete in a sport that is so raw, so visceral in feeling. Oh, with car racing, so it's easy to see the field as just machines. But with motorcycles, each bike is seen as an extension of the rider. A living, breathing limb that racers use to perform some of the most exciting feats on the planet. Just watch the insane POV clips, the do or die Hail Mary saves, and of course, the record-breaking lap time. Oh the fastest God, outright lap ever was set by Peter Hickman riding a BMW S1000RR. 16 minutes and 42 seconds. And he did it. I reacted to this and it got blocked. I'm sorry, bro. I don't know what to do. I reacted to it and it got blocked immediately. I don't know. <laughs> by averaging over 135 miles per hour for the entire lap. Then there's our old friend, Michael Dunlop, who still holds the records in super sport and lightweight TT classes. And then there's Jenny Tinmith, the fastest female ever to lap the Isle of Man, who did an 1852 in her CBR 1000. And then there's arguably the most Bad. fun class to watch, sidecars. Sidecars were added to the list of classes in 1923, and it's been going strong since. These things are Side sick. Cars. Just Look at this. Absolutely bonkers stuff. The fastest sidecar lap ever. Let me know if I should check the sidecars out. What is that? Sidecars? was done by brothers Tom and Ben Burkhall in their Honda CBR. They averaged 119 miles per hour and lapped what? in 1859. An average of 119 miles per hour while leaning like this. Absolute mad lads. And this event isn't just what? a big deal for motorcycle racers and enthusiasts. It's also a massive revenue stream for the Isle of Man as well, bringing in millions of pounds every year. In 2019 alone, the event generated an estimated 37 million pounds Ooh. for the Manx economy. And that's the thing. The TT is an integral part of the Manx Damn. economy. When the pandemic struck, it was estimated that the race closure cost the Isle of Man somewhere around 246 million pounds. So despite the numerous calls to ban the event Damn. by bereaved families, politicians, and onlookers, it only makes sense that the Manx government would continue to greenlight the TT, as it's such a big... They're bringing it, 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 it's helping the country, helping the community, why not? I mean, you know? Part of their economy. In fact, yeah. the only times that there hasn't been a TT was World War I, World War II, the COVID pandemic, and 2001, when everyone in England got foot and mouth disease. But let me take a step what? back. <laughs> Does any of this 
matter? The opinions of people like us, outsiders looking in. We may not think the risk is worth it, but to the spectators, the organizers, the racers themselves, hell, the motorcycling world at large, Oh, yeah, it no, is. I respect their decision. Those who take on the TT are not coerced. They do it willingly, be it for fame or fortune yeah. or just for the thrill of it. And if somebody like Michael Dunlop, who's lost his entire kin to motorcycle racing, can come back to take his 21st title all while proclaiming that the TT should never stop, who are we to tell him otherwise? Over 300 people have died climbing Everest over the years. Over 500 Ooh. people have died in professional boxing alone. And since 1981, there have been over 400 deaths base jumping around the world. And while all of those communities have worked to make their sports safer over the years, just like the TT, they are still dangerous, just like the TT. So armed with that knowledge, let me ask you again, is it worth it? Like much of life, it's a bit of a I mean, yeah, if you enjoy one it, that perhaps sure. will never have a clear answer. But for me, somebody who's too afraid to ride a motorcycle on the highway, I can't help but feel tremendous admiration for the feats of heroism, the Ooh, unfolding nice legacy and the absolute motorsports madness that only the Isle of Man TT can create. Thanks for watching. If you like the video, please do hit the like button. Yo, I hope you guys enjoy it. Let me know in comments what you think about this reaction. Also, leave a like, comment, and... Oh, yeah, I already said comment. Leave a like and subscribe, join the fam, and yeah, I'll see you for the next one.